Welcome back everyone. We're continuing our session on Hindu sculpture. We left in session four looking at the Hindu triumvirate, which we will begin this session with a quick review. So just give me a moment here. All right, so, and we want to move that out of the way. All right, so we're looking here on the left at Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu, which we discussed in our last um, session. We can understand that these three gods that essentially maintain, create, and manage the, the universe and humans, the human beings which, of which we are a part um, uh, through their various um, particular charisms or powers. But each of these gods is complex and can change slightly um, depending on its context of devotional worship. But they're understood as a triumvirate in containing um, the key um, forces of God in a single triad, but we can't forget the mother goddess and who is at once the wife, um, takes various um, forms depending on the god as a deity's wife. So for example, Shiva is, his consort is, beloved consort is Parvati. Well, Parvati is understood um, as the mother goddess as she took that form. Um, the mother goddess may also be fierce, as I said in our previous um, session. And she is mother and um, and protector. And so this is we're looking here at the key the key forces and figures in um, the Hindu pantheon and its connection to maintaining, creating, and ensuring the order and sustenance of the world. So let's begin now after having looked at. Um, an example of the three, the triumvirate together at Brahma and the attributes of Brahma. When I say attribute, that just means something that we can identify that is accompanying the human form um, here of more or less human with four heads, of course, but you know, uh, of, of Brahma that we can identify that this is what Brahma is associated with. It's almost like a, a name or um, or a grammar of, 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 us, of images that we associate um, different gods with, and this allows their identification in temples immediately, and not only identification of which god, but what state they're in. So it's a grammar of signs using recognizable objects like flowers, prayer beads, weapons, animals, and these are called attributes. They help us attribute um, that this is Brahma um, and, and not um, Shiva and not Vishnu or Ganesh, who we're not talking about in, in this um, series, but it's, he's in your textbook and he's unforgettable. So you'll, you know him and you can read about him. He's the son of Shiva and Parvati. Okay, so Looking at Brahma and his attributes, first we notice he has four heads. So one, two, three, four frontally. And then here's a view of the back with different lighting. And I'm not sure if it's been subject to some kind of deterioration or it's become less polished or why the back of Brahma is uh, a slightly different texture, but it is the same sculpture, and it could just be the photograph and the lighting. At any rate, we can see a total of four heads, and if you start at the top, um, looking at Brahma, you notice, hopefully, I think I might have a better detail. Let's see. Well, if I come to it, I'll call your attention to it. You'll notice at the top here these kind of flowing, thick, almost like toothpaste or um, something organic that's kind of flowing from the top of Brahma's head. These are stylistic representations of dreadlocks, to use a common um, term, um, matted hair that is associated with a priest and an ascetic. 
um, in Indian culture. The idea that you let your hair grow long and you don't comb it is another way of expressing a renunciation of the body. We know Jains would remove their hair um, as a rejection of the maintenance of hair and um, a sacrifice and penance, but we see in the um, Hindu tradition hair that's basically unmaintained is also a sign of a renunciation um, and would be associated with the austerities and prayer life of a priest, particularly an ascetic priest, or Brahmin is what we should call it. You can see the back of the matted hair here, these dreadlocks. Um, you can see the long elongated ears really nicely here um, in the back, which is the signi uh, signifier of the princely status here in foreshortening. The foreheads indicate the creative activities of Brahma um, spread in all four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. So his creation covers all points of the, of the universe. His upper right hand, um, you can see here, so it's our left, his right, um, brings together freedom from fear. This gesture is a mudra, that means just means gesture sacred gesture. Um, you see I'm doing it with my hand, if I can keep it the screen. Um, means freedom from fear. And it's uh, often, it's probably, it's associated with um, that he, you know, he or she who is uh, adhering to the practices of being um, a Hindu seeking growth in consciousness and fulfilling their dharma. Uh, and so here is that sign, the lotus, um, and, and of course creation is, um, and the cycles is part of a freedom. You need not fear, there will, creation will continue. Um, the lotus is um, associated with the process of creation. A lotus flower starts underwater in the mud and it grows from heavy, muddy water and, and slowly moves up to the surface to blossom this exquisite large floating um, flower. I'm getting pop-ups on my screen. I don't know if Zoom will have you see them, but in any case, I hope not. Um, this floating lotus that comes to the surface and opens her leaves, um, that's really seen as a metaphor of um, or analogous to the process of the soul leaving the, the, the mud and the weight of the body to float on the surface in Moshka. So you might, if you find that to be interesting, just look up Lotus and you'll find references to this um, process. It's quite beautiful and evocative. So that Lotus here in his hand is associated with the process of creation but intr intrinsically linked to specifically a process for humans uh, well, for all consciousness to eventually reach Mushka, not just humans, but all forms of consciousness and life. The lower um, hand uh, gesture here in his would be, I'll just show you where we are because it's hard to tell. Here we're looking now, we've just completed these two arms. Uh, it, it should be obvious at this point, and I didn't say it, and I apologize. He has four arms, four heads, four arms important. Um, so we have one, two, the be not afraid gesture of one arm, and then the lotus creation arm number two. Arm number three is, a, um, uh, is the gesture that we're turning to now, and arm number four is holding um, prayer beads. So here's arm number three. It's a gift-giving gesture, um, the gift of creation he will bestow on the world. So that is what that warm um, giving gesture suggests. And then um, upper left hand holds prayer beads associated with a priestly appearance. And that's not necessarily, um, these aren't always unique to Brahma. We see other deities holding um, prayer beads. But what we do as, um, if, we were if we are or were or would be practitioners of Hinduism, we would know how to piece together, okay, so there's no prayer beads, but there's four heads and four arms, that's Brahma. Um, if there is not four heads, but there are prayer beads, it's not Brahma, probably. Um, and so that's kind of how you engage these objects is this um, reflection on these attributes and context. We, uh, here is the detail I couldn't find earlier of the dreadlocks, the matted hair, some kind of beautiful crown, stylized eyebrows, um, 
and then moving forward now we're going to turn to we've left Brahma and we're going to look and Brahma is I believe let me just quickly go back to so this Brahma is made of granite and it's from the Chola dynasty so notice now we're moving around it's not chronological anymore uh, this particular work um, is I believe I've given you the reference but I may not have yes this is in the northwest frontier um, the Shwati Valley so up in the Indus Valley civilization area around 9th century now we're turning to Punjab India in the 10th and 11th century so right around um, simultaneous to the growth of the Chola dynasty in the north of India um, with the, uh, the end of the Gupta and uh, dynasty we find um, other developments occurring which we aren't covering in this class but in Punjab there is a very rich artistic culture developing and here we're looking at a, um, a really complex or not so much complex, it's very easy to read this image once you know what to look for, but intricate um, and dense in its, um, in its many levels of meaning um, or ways of conveying meaning, um, what we're looking at here as Vishnu. So let's start with the chakram. This looks a little bit like um, if you were a seamstress, something you'd roll to make holes in fabric or um, if you like to cook, um, a, a, a turning blade. Um, this is a bladed wheel and it's a weapon that's distinct to subcontinent India uh, and it can be um, held onto or thrown um, and it's um, Vishnu is attribute, a war discus. So if you see this or a part of it in a um, temple sculpture you're looking and it's not a female in which case it's maybe Durga uh, who is he gives, um, he sometimes loans his chakram out to Durga. Um, and then uh, the attribute of the conch shell belonging to Vishnu. Now remember Vishnu is our dear Krishna, is the avatar of Krishna. He's the loving uh, God who comes to humanity, the maintainer, the, the preserver. He neither creates nor destroys, but draws us close to his heart and um, closer then to um, a transcendent truth of liberation, which is what you're um, reading about in the, the Bhagavad Gita right now. The conch shell is associated with a sacred sound um, that is the sound of the beginning, uh, a sacred sound associated with um, uh, the transcendent state and liberation um, and, and sometimes the creation of the universe, but so is rhythm at times. But the conch shell produces the sacred om that you read about um, a, a module ago in the Vedic material, or two modules ago, the very short module during, um, you may or may not have looked at during Easter break. That om, that sacred sound is, the, is comes from Vishnu's conch shell. The conch shell is beautifully defined here with this carving of the hands like tucked into the opening of the mouth of the shell that has the fingers are echoing the actual diagonal of that of a conch shell the way they're formed and then this lovely articulation of spirals um, complements um, this diagonal motion in a balanced way um, hindu sculpture is very much in, uh, appreciates the contrast between smooth, supple um, skin um, that has virtually no very variety. You see the knees here are barely articulated and they enjoy the, the, the contrast between such simplicity and smoothness with intricate surface detail. So this is stylistically now, not some, an attribute of Vishnu, this is a stylistic trait of Hindu sculpture, this love of the contrast between the smooth and the intricate. Vishnu is also holding prayer beads here, and you can once again see um, 
this, the contrast between smooth and intricate. So here are the prayer beads. And uh, Vishnu also has four arms. So it's um, another case of a four-armed god. He's holding a mace, this huge club, an elegant club a weapon with one arm. And then his other arm is raised um, and held uh, holding prayer beads. But it is also understood to be the same gesture that we see Brahmash um, indicating the mudra of need not fear, raising the hand. Look at only need not fear. So it's kind of like the, the palms are, I can't figure out how to do this in reverse, but the palms are kind of pushed out and then the fingers kind of curve forward. I think you can see that. And then the thumb goes forward. So it's kind of a very, you see this in Indian dance as well, this kind of pushing out of the palm and then the flexing forward of the top most joints of the fingers and then the turning in of the thumb. So here we see that once more. The abhaya, which means fear not, mudra means gesture. We need not have any fear. And then the long garland of flowers that wraps around Vishnu is evident here. You can see it clearly here too. Here the head is surrounded by an elaborate halo or nimbus, similar to, um, to the Buddhist figure we saw in the Gupta period, but this is a very typical um, halo that we see in Indian, the Indic faiths across um, the faiths, indicating a supernatural being or a saint. And then I'm going to go over some of the rich details around this, um, this representation of Vishnu. First of all, we have um, personification. So we've been talking about attributes. An attribute is the chakram. An attribute is the conch shell, the mace. And these associate and allow us to attribute this sculpture to, um, to the intention of, of creating an image of Vishnu. These figures beside Vishnu are actually um, echoing or enhancing the attribute um, as, as personification. So they're holding the chakram here and this figure is holding a conch shell. So personification means when, for example, a human form takes on a, an association with an abstract idea or ideal, like the personification of love might be the Venus figure. Um, the personification of envy might be um, a green figure that, you know, is cracking a mirror. Um, the personification of uh, of a simple uh, chakram is, is indicated simply because this little figure is holding the chakram. So it's a human form taking on an indication of, of a, an object or an idea. That's what personification means. Here it's the conch shell. And then these are um, attendant figures that are just enhancing the, um, the majesty of this figure as a kind of court kind of courtly um, grouping of figures. If you look behind, you can see barely visible two pots. And these pots are producing like the fecundity of life and foliage just spilling out and growing here on both sides. And as we continue up, we have um, two characteristic um, composite animal types. One is a um, a lion goat, which is very clearly delineated here. Um, here is an elephant, and we can only presume it turns into a crocodile. I don't know actually myself um, how I would be able to see that here, but up in these upper, um, from the back, you can see the elephant as, has the bottom side of a crocodile. So these are kind of composite, um, fantastic figures also surrounding um, Vishnu, and you see these in miniature painting as well. And then at the top here, we have, um, sorry, here's the Nimbus, excuse me. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So I, th I thought I had these isolated and labeled, but I don't. So at the top we have Brahma, you can recognize Brahma because, how 
many heads? One, two, three, and a fourth is facing away, which we can't see. So that we know is Brahma. Um, he's also in a, the mudra of Abhaya here. Uh, and looking to the right, we are looking at um, the figure of Shiva, and we haven't talked um, at length about Shiva yet, um, but it's you can see at the very top, I'll go to a detail, um, a kind of forked flame-like form, and that's indicating again um, fire and the destruction of samsara to liberate the soul, and then here is a hand gesture in that mudra, be not afraid. So this is a very rich and intricate um, image uh, that is literally bursting with indications of the fecundity and love um, and, and attributes of Vishnu. Uh, so we'll now move, um, but we will actually move to end this video because I'm slightly over time. And we will continue on in our next video to talk about Shiva in both an iconic and an iconic form um, as our next um, discussion. So I'll see you back here very soon. If I can just get my screen, there we go, stop sharing.